On the evening of Christ's Mass in the year 800, better known as Christmas Day in the modern world, a momentous incident occurred in the old Basilica of St. Peter's in the city of Rome. That night, as Mass was being celebrated, Pope Leo III placed a crown on the head of Charles, King of the Franks, in the historical records more widely known as Charlemagne. Leo then proclaimed Charles as the new Roman Emperor, the first to bear the title in Western Europe, since the deposition of Emperor Romulus Augustulus back in the year 476. In the propaganda of the time, this was presented as a spontaneous act that Leo had decided upon of his own volition. The head of the Roman Catholic Church bestowing an exalted title on the King of the Franks, a man who had conquered most of Western and Central Europe since he became ruler of Francia back in 768. We shouldn't be fooled. This was almost certainly a premeditated act that Leo and Charlemagne had planned together over the foregoing year and a half. But the significance of it was enormous all the same. With his crowning as Holy Roman Emperor, Charlemagne was acknowledged as having reassembled much of the Western Roman Empire under the rule of one monarch and now was being recognized as the temporal ruler of Christendom by its spiritual ruler, the Bishop of Rome, or Pope. Here we examine how Charlemagne came to become the first Roman emperor in over three centuries and why Leo crowned him in this way on that Christmas day. In order to fully appreciate how immensely impressive the reign of the man who was crowned at Rome on Christmas Day 800 was, we need to briefly assess the state of Western and Central Europe around the time of his birth in the middle of the 8th century. Though visitors to Rome at that time, and indeed tourists even today, could still see relics of the Roman Empire in the shape of the Colosseum and other impressive monuments and temples, it was centuries since the fall of the Western Roman Empire. It had collapsed in the 5th century as a result of two and a half centuries of civil wars and invasions of its borders by Germanic and Asiatic tribes. Eventually these tribes conquered the Roman provinces of Britain, Gaul in what is now France, Germania, Noricum further to the south around modern-day Austria, Hispania, Italy, and even territories in North Africa. The Angles and the Saxons, for instance, had conquered much of Britain. The Franks and Burgundians, amongst other groups, had conquered Gaul, and Charlemagne was himself of Frankish descent. The Visigoths had taken Spain along with the Suebi, while the Ostrogoths were believed to be the primary group which conquered Italy. As they did so, the lands across what had been the Western Roman Empire descended into a dark age, one in which these countries had experienced a drastic social, economic and political collapse in the 6th and 7th centuries as living standards plummeted and the kind of effective bureaucratic government that Roman Empire had offered vanished. Instead, weak, decentralized states based on the personal power of warlord kings took Rome's place. Moreover, the invasions of these new groups did not stop, but rather new groups such as the Lombards continued to arrive, the latter group eventually conquering much of northern Italy, while pagan groups such as the Wends, Avars and Slavs would raid periodically into Germania and Noricum. To compound matters, in the late 7th century a new challenger emerged in the south as the Arab Muslims and their Berber allies conquered North Africa and then parts of southern Europe such as Sicily and Sardinia. Beginning in 711 they conquered the Iberian Peninsula in a rapid campaign which brought them into France. They were only prevented from establishing a presence here because Charles Martel, the mayor of the palace within the Frankish kingdom, a position equivalent to that of Prime Minister, defeated them at the Battle of Tours in 732 and then pushed them back towards the Pyrenees. As far as the Kingdom of Franks is concerned, by 509, Clovis I had unified all the Frankish tribes, previously divided in small kingdoms, into one realm. Consequently, 
He became the first king of the Franks and the founder of the Merovingian dynasty, solidifying Francia as Europe's most powerful kingdom. Largely owing to his conversion, the Franks underwent Christianization. After Clovis died, the kingdom once again plunged into instability and fragmentation. Given the lack of clear succession guidelines, the country was partitioned among his four sons, leading to multiple rulers within the same kingdom. This division would eventually lead to the weakening of the dynasty and the rise in influence of the mayors of the palace. It was into this environment of a beleaguered Western Christendom that had experienced centuries of difficulty after the collapse of the Roman Empire that Charlemagne was born. The ruler who is known today as Charlemagne, a name derived from Charles and Magnus, meaning great, so that his name means Charles the Great, was born on the 2nd of April in the year 748. He was the grandson of Charles Martel, that able and gifted Frankish politician who had defeated the Arabs and Berbers at Tours in 732. Martel had died in 741, though by the time he did, he had effectively become the real power within the kingdom of the Franks, with the royal family, the Merovingian dynasty, having become little more than puppet rulers. In 751, when Charlemagne was still an infant, his father, Charles Martel's son and successor as mayor of the palace, Pepin the Short, decided to dispense with the Merovingians altogether, deposing King Childeric III and establishing himself as King Pepin, the first ruler of the Carolingian dynasty. As his father ruled the Kingdom of the Franks, which approximated with much of modern-day France, Charlemagne grew up, receiving a very good education by the standards of the time. The Roman Catholic Church was the one area of Western European society which was buoyant at this time, and young Charles was taught by many leading church figures. He could, according to accounts of him in later life, speak and read numerous languages, including Old French, Latin, Franconian, a language spoken in the Rhineland region of Western Germania, and some Greek. Yet much of his education would also have focused on the martial arts, how to ride a horse and fight. And while he could speak and read several languages, it did not necessarily follow that he could write. Many historians have suggested he never learned to do so properly, a feature of many European royal rulers down to at least the 12th century. From a young age, Charlemagne was being groomed by his father to succeed him. The principle of primogeniture, where the eldest child would succeed to all of the lands of a monarch, was not established in early medieval times. Instead, King Pepin intended that Charlemagne and his other son, Carloman, would jointly succeed him and divide the kingdom of the Franks between them. The pair were both being listed along with their father, on royal charters issued during the 760s when Carloman was barely into his teenage years, and Charlemagne, the more senior of the pair by three years, was nearing adulthood by medieval standards. When their father died in 768, the pair ascended as joint rulers of the Frankish kingdom. It was not a good arrangement, and the pair clashed in the late 760s, leading different armies and establishing rival governments. A longer-lasting and more destructive civil war was only avoided when Carloman took ill and died in December 771. Accounts of the time claimed his death was the result of an excessive nosebleed. We can surely ignore this explanation, but at the same time, there is no evidence to suggest foul play on Charlemagne's part. Regardless, his brother's death was extremely beneficial, and Charlemagne now ascended as the unrivaled king of the Franks, at just 23 years of age. Charlemagne didn't stop there, not anywhere near it. Next, he began a series of aggressive campaigns to use his bases on the western side of the River Rhine to expand into northern and central Germany. He did so in a series of bloody wars against the Saxons, 
a Germanic group that had occupied much of Germany centuries earlier as the Roman Empire collapsed. One of the most significant elements of the Saxons' wars was that Charlemagne also brought forced conversion of the pagan Saxons to Christianity, hand in hand with military conquest. It was this role as a Christian crusader which encouraged Pope Leo to declare Charlemagne to be a new Holy Roman Emperor decades later. By 777, the campaigns had broadly been successful, and Charlemagne held a gathering of Saxon chieftains near Paderborn, where he accepted their submission to Frankish rule, with many agreeing to convert to Christianity. And there were wars elsewhere, a notable one, which was initiated in the mid-770s, was a campaign over the Pyrenees and against the Muslim Moors that ruled most of Iberia. Progress here was more limited, though, against the better organised and more militarily capable Arabs and Berbers. Girona was captured after many years in the mid-780s, while the latter stages of Charlemagne's reign saw a county of Barcelona established across much of Catalonia. This would act as an enormous boon to the Christians who held out in northern Spain against Islamic occupation and who were beginning the long Reconquista, whereby the Christian states of the north gradually conquered the Muslim powers of Iberia over a period of eight centuries. The 780s and 790s brought the Franks into unprecedented campaigns eastwards, some of these were initiated with the goal of securing control over the region corresponding with modern-day Bavaria. Others were against the Avars, a Eurasian people who had moved into Central Europe back in the late 5th century, taking advantage of the collapse of Roman authority and the breakdown of the Empire of the Huns following the death of their leader, Attila the Hun. Over the centuries that followed, they allied with other groups like the Slavs and Bulgars, to control a vast stretch of territory running from the Austrian Alps east to the Pontic Caspian steppe north of the Black Sea. Charlemagne was one of the first European rulers to campaign very successfully against them, bringing Frankish control over Austria and parts of Bohemia. Thus, by the end of the 8th century, Charlemagne had established an empire which extended from Catalonia in northeastern Spain to the North Sea and from the Atlantic Ocean well into Central Europe. It was achieved with ruthlessness. The annals and histories of the time speak of the Franks devastating the countryside in which they campaigned, burning crops and destroying settlements to pummel their adversaries into submission. Another instance of cruelty is known as the Massacre of Verdun, when Charlemagne, after squashing the Saxon rebellion in 782, ordered the killing of 4,500 prisoners. This is what is written about it in Royal Frankish Annals. When he heard this, the Lord King Charles rushed to the place with all the Franks that he could gather on short notice and advanced to where the Aller flows into the Visa. Then all the Saxons came together again, submitted to the authority of the Lord King, and surrendered the evildoers who were chiefly responsible for this revolt to be put to death, 4,500 of them. This sentence was carried out, Charlemagne's reign was not simply about military activity and conquests. Having built up a great empire over the first twenty or so years of his reign, he became the overseer of a cultural renaissance which had no precedent in early medieval Europe. Beginning in the mid-780s, he issued royal commands and manifestos which directed the governors of parts of his empire to establish scribal schools and educational institutions to train clerics and scribes to read and write. At the same time, groups of scribes were employed to begin copying out in elegant handwriting onto vellum and parchment manuscripts copies of the ancient texts of the Greeks and Romans. Many writings by such exalted ancient writers as the satirical poets Juvenal and Martial, the philosophers, Lucretius and Boethius, the rhetorician and orator, Cicero, and even the commentaries on the Gallic Wars and Civil War of Julius Caesar, might not have survived down to the present day, had numerous copies of them not been made in the late 8th and early 9th centuries. 
Many of these copies ended up in monastic libraries where they were discovered hundreds of years later by Italian humanists who ushered in the Italian Renaissance. Yet this was not just about preserving ancient texts. Charlemagne was also anxious to train a new generation of well-educated scribes who could administer his realms more effectively through tax collection and the development of a royal bureaucracy. Many of these same officials and the monks within the monasteries, which became central to the empire, would also begin writing histories and chronicles of their own times. Much of what we know about the history of early medieval Europe comes from the pens of these scribes and their successors. All of this was overseen from the royal palace that Charlemagne had built at Aachen, right around the region where Germany, the Netherlands and Belgium all border each other today. Though most of the palace has not survived, some of the chapel has. It attests to the architectural renaissance which also began under Charlemagne. Generally speaking, this cultural revival marks a key period in the revitalization of European society after the Dark Ages that followed the destruction of the Western Roman Empire. Today, it is known as the Carolingian Renaissance, Carolingian coming from the Latin Carolus for Charles and Renaissance meaning rebirth. Hence, the Carolingian Renaissance means the rebirth of European culture during the reign of Charles. It was at the height of his power, with his empire extending from the Atlantic Ocean to Hungary and from the North Sea to the plain of Lombardy, and a vibrant court culture emerging at Aachen, that Charlemagne received word from northern Italy in the year 799 that Pope Leo III needed his help. The Bishop of Rome had been attacked by his political enemies in the Eternal City that year, and fearing for his safety he had fled to northern Italy. There he sent messengers to Aachen, requesting Charlemagne's aid in restoring him to his position as Pope. Charlemagne called him north, over the Alps, and met with Leo at the town of Paderborn. It was most likely there that Leo agreed to crown Charlemagne in Rome as Emperor if he agreed to help restore Leo as Pope. Wars elsewhere, along the borders in Germany, precluded him from acting on this offer immediately. But in the autumn of 800, Charlemagne headed south to Italy and reimposed Leo as the Pope in Rome. In the weeks that followed, Charles and his itinerant court remained in Rome to celebrate the Christmas festivities there. It was in the midst of this that Leo crowned him as Holy Roman Emperor at St. Peter's on Christmas Day. Charlemagne quickly sought recognition of his new status from further afield sending emissaries to the two other great powers of the known world at that time, the Byzantine Empire, which was essentially a continuation of the Eastern Roman Empire, and the Arab Caliphate that had emerged in the 7th and 8th centuries to conquer the entirety of the Middle East and North Africa. His diplomats sought recognition of Charlemagne's position as Holy Roman Emperor from the Byzantine Emperor in Constantinople, who was nine years old at the time, so, actually, from his mother, and the caliph in Baghdad, memorably leading Caliph Harun al-Rashid to send an elephant to Charlemagne's court at Aachen. His accession as emperor did not bring an end to Charlemagne's wars. In the mid-800s he faced constant border tensions along the southern edge of the Jutland Peninsula against the independent Danes, further to the north. There were also raids along the coastline of the Low Countries and northern France, as the Norse attacks on Western Christendom began to gather pace at the beginning of the Viking Age. In the midst of these issues, he also had to contend with a succession crisis. Charlemagne had numerous sons from multiple marriages, but several of these died in the later years of Charlemagne's reign disrupting his plans to divide his empire up. Eventually he settled on his son Louis as succeeding to the entirety of his empire and he crowned him as his co-ruler and successor in 813 at a ceremony at Aachen. By then, Charles was an elderly man by the standards of the time, entering his 65th year. That autumn he grew increasingly ill, 
suffering from a range of conditions, including pleurisy. He died on the 28th of January 8th, 14, and was buried in the chapel at Arken. By the time that he died, having reigned for nearly half a century, Charlemagne had built the greatest empire that had been seen in Western and Central Europe since the collapse of the Western Roman Empire back in the 5th century. Unfortunately, it did not last very long. While Charles's empire passed intact to his son, Louis the Pious, when he died in the year 840, a civil war effectively broke out between Charlemagne's three grandsons, Lothair, Charles and Louis. This eventually led to the splitting up of the Frankish Empire into three sections, one covering much of modern-day France in the west, one corresponding roughly with Germany in the east, and a third state running down the middle and covering the Low Countries, the Franco-German border regions, and into the Swiss Alps. Furthermore, the French parts of his empire came under extensive pressure in the second half of the 9th century when the Vikings began assailing northern France and eventually conquered what is now Normandy. Yet the Holy Roman Empire survived as an entity, one which came to centre on Germany. Ultimately, the political institutions created by Charlemagne and the Pope in 800 survived over a thousand years, only finally being dissolved in 1806 by Napoleon Bonaparte. Because of his influence, his name was changed to signify his greatness. It was adopted by many Slavic peoples as their term for king, and he was referred to as Father of Europe due to the impact his rule and legacy left upon the old continent. Let us end where we began, with the scene of his coronation as an emperor, taken from the royal Frankish annals. On the very day of the Lord's most sacred birthday, when the king rose from prayer in front of the shrine of the blessed Apostle Peter to partake in the Mass, Pope Leo placed a crown on his head and he was hailed by all the Roman people. To Charles Augustus, crowned by God, the great and peaceful emperor of the Romans, life and victory. And after the acclamations he was addressed by the Pope in the manner of the ancient princes, and with the name of patrician now removed, he was called Emperor and Augustus.